Okay, so welcome everybody. Welcome and good afternoon. Okay, a few people is already here. So we are going to quickly do an overview of PSS. A lot of you probably know me already. I'm Shana Jacques and I see a lot of familiar faces and name, not faces, names and welcome back. My name is Shana Jacques. I'm the director of community event. And then we have Kiara Soto from PSS. She's the intake specialist and she's gonna quickly do an overview for us for P about PSS. Kiara? Thank you, Shaina. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kiara Soto. Um, I am the intake care consultant at Circle of Care. And we are a caregiver support program that offers free services to those caregivers um, who are caring for someone who's chronically ill, suffering from memory loss or dementia. And these services include counseling, support groups, educational trainings, uh, advocacy, respite care, and we also assist with uh, long-term care planning. If you're interested in receiving more information on our program or our services, uh, you can feel free to give us a call at 866-665-1713, or you can also visit our website at pssusa.org. Um, and thank you for your time and continue to enjoy the rest of the presentation. Thank you, Kiara. Um, again, welcome everybody. Today, we're going to have a very interesting uh, presentation. We have Ron and Debbie. Um, if you do have any question, I want you to add it on the chat so that way we can answer all of them. And maybe if we can go over everything, we'll be able to do it. Um, Okay, we got it, Jackie. So without further ado, Ron, you can start. Let me make sure. All right, thank you so much. I, I appreciate it, Shana. This is uh, terrific. Uh, great to be here again. And today's topic is demystifying probate and probate litigation. Uh, my name is Ron Fatula, and I'll be doing this with Debbie Rosenfeld. We're from the same firm. Uh, we're the senior attorneys at the firm. And uh, Debbie, it's a pleasure to do this with you today. Uh, I'm very excited about it. I'm going to start off with some of the basics on wills, because a will is what gets probated. Uh, <clears throat> and I'm going to talk about the difference between wills and trusts. A lot of people don't understand that. And what happens when you don't have a will and you don't have a trust, and then you pass away, what happens? So uh, I'm going to go through that then Debbie will go through uh, uh, quite a bit of the probate process, the probate litigation, et cetera. So uh, Jackie, next slide. Thank you. So, you know, with regard to the uh, virus, you know, more than ever, we are confronted with our mortality. Uh, this has been such a rough year for so many of us, uh, you know, during COVID. Uh, everyone that I know of on this call, you know, has, has knows someone that they've lost that they truly love. And uh, it's just a kick in, in the backside, I guess, to all of us that we have to plan ahead. We have to get our documents in place. And uh, we are going to talk about probate today, but we're also going to talk about ways to avoid probate. Uh, probate is not a four letter word. It's not so terrible, but uh, sometimes it's a good idea to avoid probate. Um, so let me go over a couple of basic items regarding a will. So what does a will do? A will is a document that sets forth where your assets go when you pass away. A lot of people, you know, we don't wanna think about it, but this is life and we wanna be prepared and our clients that actually get their documents in place do feel much more on top of things. They do feel relieved when they know that they've done the, these things, the will and the other documents. So the will sets forth where your assets go. Who could your assets go to? They can go to any individual. You're not forced to leave anything to anyone. Could go to anyone could go to a spouse, children, grandchildren, friends, uh, parents, nieces and nephews, uh, anybody, 
could also go to an organization, a charity, a school, and it could also, as a beneficiary, be held in a trust that we put within the will called a testamentary trust. There are two different main types of trusts. You have a living trust, a trust signed while you're living, that's good right here, right now, and a trust that's put into the will called a testamentary trust that's only good once that will is probated. So it gives you a perspective on how important that probate process is, especially when you have a trust within the will. And again, Debbie will go through that whole process. Very important that you tailor your will to your individual wants and needs. I see many clients as they age and their children, their nieces, their nephews are whispering in their ears. Uh, you could listen, but make sure that your will is what you want and what you need, and you'll feel better about it. Uh, you have to be careful that if you're on Medicaid and you have some assets, including a home, the will does not uh, uh, protect those assets from Medicaid recovery. If, for example, you might have a co-op or a condo or a home that is in a living trust or a Medicaid asset protection trust, that will avoid Medicaid recovery in the future, but just having the asset in your name that will be probated will be subject to Medicaid recovery if you do go on Medicaid for home care, for a home health attendant, or nursing home Medicaid. So you gotta be careful. You know, when uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about trust, but there's a reason that I talk about trusts as well. Um, now, how do you provide for a spouse that's already on Medicaid? Well, you have to be careful. You can't do that in a, a living trust. If you're a spouse, and you wanna provide for a spouse that's already on Medicaid, that trust has to go into the will. Stepping back from this for a moment, these rules tend to be very complicated. Uh, what might seem very simple on the surface is not truly simple. So what we go through all the circumstances, and for example, if there's a spouse on Medicaid, uh, you wanna do a special type of supplemental needs trust that will go into the will. Earlier, I said that you can name anybody that you want as a beneficiary, and you can. However, you should know, and look at the last bullet point, a spouse has the right to take the greater of one third of the assets or $50,000, whichever is greater. Now, that's called the right of election. Now, that's only there if the spouse doesn't get that amount. So if the individual that passes away has, let's say, 100,000, the right of election would be 50,000. It's the greater of 50,000 or one third of the estate. So you don't have to name the spouse but the spouse actually has the right to elect this. And it's not because the spouse needs it or doesn't need it. If you show you're married legally, you have that right of election. Next slide. Next slide, Jackie. Thank you. Uh, so now I'm going to talk about a trust just for a couple of minutes. And the reason I'm doing this is because you have a will. The will needs to be probated for the assets to be distributed. Probate is not so terrible. But once you go through pro probate, there is Medicaid recovery. And there's certain other issues. Easier for someone to contest the will, et cetera. There's another document that can also get assets out and be distributed to beneficiaries without the probate process, and that's called a trust. Again, a trust could be in your will, 
That's called the testamentary trust, but your will still has, will still have to be probated or you have a living trust. Now that trust that's signed while you're living could either be a revocable or an irrevocable trust. And the law is very, very clear. If you want an asset to be in that trust, let's say a, a, a co-op apartment or a bank account or a brokerage account, you actually have to retitle the name of that co-op or the address. And that deed has to show the name of the owner is the living trust. And if you have a personal item such as jewelry, we can actually use an assignment uh, of that jewelry or personal property into that trust. When is the trust terminated? Well, you could revoke it if it's a revocable trust or upon certain contingencies, if something happens like death, some people say within 10 years and you have to know that with a will that has a trust in it or with a living trust, even beyond death, assets can continue to be held by that trust to protect the beneficiaries, such as a, a child with special needs. If there's a disabled child or individual, you want that, those assets to be protected from public benefits such as SSI and Medicaid that they could be getting. Next slide. So who are the parties to a trust? We have the creator of the trust called the grantor or settler. Just like in a will, the individual that creates the will is called the testator. In a trust, we have the trustee that manages the assets and distributes the assets according to the rules that we create for that trust. But in the will, we have an individual called the executor. The executor is the one that manages the assets and ultimately distributes the assets to the beneficiaries set forth in the will. But be careful and listen to Debbie very carefully because the, the executor does not have right to control any of the assets till we go through that probate process. Uh, the second bullet, big bullet point, <clears throat> and I want to be very clear about it, and I'm not just saying this, you know, for our benefit, but a living trust, <clears throat> excuse me, should not be done by yourself. It should be done by an elder law and a state planning attorney. There are so many little nuances uh, that need to be in there to protect your assets. Uh, and many times uh, an individual will ask, I'm looking at that third bullet point, what's the difference between an estate and a trust? Well, depends on the context of, of, of uh, using these words. Uh, many individuals talk about their estate as the assets that they have currently. Like I may talk about my estate, but typically it's uh, a, a term that talks about your assets once you pass away. Assets in a trust are just, you know, is where the trust holds those assets. And we also use the term trust estate. So I don't want to confuse you, but many times, you know, the estate, you know, you talk about your estate, that's what you have. Typically, that's what you have when you pass away. And we do have the trust estate, the assets that are held in the trust. Uh, next slide, Jackie. So wills versus trust, what's better? Uh, typically, uh, not for everyone, but for most individuals, uh, we think that a trust along with a will probably is the best way to go because you get asset protection, a good chance of avoiding probate, uh, you uh, may have privacy concerns. Well, the will is open for everyone to see. A trust keeps everything private. Uh, if you feel that you might have someone that might contest a will, uh, the trust 
is a way to minimize that contest. Uh, also, a trust expedites, speeds up the distribution of assets. Because with a will, you have to probate it before assets are distributed. With a trust, it, you can uh, distribute uh, assets right away. Still, a good practice is that we do an accounting for the trustee and executor's benefit, et cetera. But uh, if, for example, we have a supplemental needs trust for a disabled child, and that child needs some money right away, well, with a trust, the trustee can write some checks out uh, so that child is protected. Um, so, uh, you know, generally, we like trusts along with a will called a pour over will, but not in all circumstances. Every circumstance is different. Next slide, Jackie. Uh, just want you to know that a will and a trust are not the only important documents. Healthcare proxy, where, who's going to make your healthcare decisions if you can't make them? A living will, what your healthcare wishes are. And we spoke about living trusts already. Another document, like a will, that sets forth where your assets go, but without probate. Next slide, Jackie. And this will be my last slide. And this goes over where your assets go if you don't have a will, and you don't have assets in a trust, and you don't have assets that have beneficiaries designated on them. So you might have a bank account and you name your son as the beneficiary on that account. Well, then the assets will go to your son. Uh, but assuming you don't have any of that, where do your assets go? Well, there's an article in the Estates, Powers, and Trust Law called The Laws of Intestacy. If you don't have a will or a trust or a beneficiary designation, it sets forth where your assets go. I'll just go over this for a minute uh, and explain that if you have a spouse and no children, all your assets go to the spouse. If you have children, and no spouse, all your assets go to your children or child. If you have a spouse and children, the law says that 50,000 goes to the spouse and then the assets are split 50-50. Maybe you want that, but maybe you don't. What if your spouse has dementia? You don't want half of your assets plus 50,000 to, to go to the spouse. I don't think so. Uh, but what if your spouse needs your money? You don't want to have to go to your children. So what, what the law provides is, is merely a guess by legislators as to where a typical individual living in New York would want his or her assets to go to. But you should take control based on your circumstances and have a will, have a trust, and take control of it. So for example, if you don't have a spouse and don't have children, and you don't have any uh, descendants, you know, grandchildren, et cetera, then assets go to parents and siblings, et cetera. Uh, that may be what you want, but it may not be what you want. If you go through that process, it's almost like a probate, but without the will, it's called an administration proceeding. So I just wanted to give you uh, some of the basics. Uh, I am going to run, I actually have to catch a train, I'm sorry, a plane, uh, but Debbie Rosenfeld will finish it up. Debbie, thank you so much. You're in for a treat. Debbie is a great speaker and uh, thank you so much for having thank me. Thank you. Thanks. Hi everyone. Um, okay, I hope you all can hear me. Uh, I'm Debbie Rosenfeld. It's uh, nice to be here and uh, uh, continue uh, in, in the same vein that Ron was discussing. So again, you know, you all might be saying at this point, you know, this, this lecture was supposed to be about probate and I'm not hearing anything about probate just yet. We're talking a lot. I mean, Ron has talked about wills and trusts and you're going to see why you need to have knowledge of these various processes so that 
you can make proper decisions when it comes to your own planning. So let's talk about the will ceremony. Again, we haven't even, you know, Ron has mentioned probate ever so briefly, uh, but this is all background building up to the actual probate process. Uh, but a will uh, really requires a certain amount of ceremony. And if you think about it, it's, it's, a, it's an important document. You're really uh, making a determination as to how your assets uh, get distributed in accordance with uh, after you die. And uh, it's very important. You know, obviously, it, it, it mentions here there are certain oral uh, wills or holographic wills. Uh, we're not going to focus on them. The best thing is that uh, you really, again, I agree with Ron, don't do anything that involves any type of do it yourself. Uh, the best type of thing is to uh, have a solid will. And a will basically, again, articulates what, how you want your, your assets distributed when you die. It has to be signed at the end. Um, and it has to be witnessed by uh, two people, two unrelated people. When I say unrelated, the people can be unrelated to each other, but they really shouldn't be, can't be witnessed by your children. It can't be witnessed by anybody who has some type of potential interest uh, in, in your assets after you pass away. Uh, and so typically a typical will will be anywhere from uh, I don't know, five to 30 pages, depending on the complexity. And right after the person, the person who signs the will is the testator, right after they sign, there's a certain clause um, that's read. That's the only thing that can come after the testator's signature. And the, and that clause basically says, you know, it, it, it it's, it's read before the witness is signed. And it says, uh, this is here. This is my will. Um, I uh, it it, it, it um, and I'm I'm hereby announcing. It's very important that it be announced that you the person understands why they're why what they're signing. So again, it's followed by this small. It's called an attestation clause. It's the only actual writing that can legally come after the person's signature. Um, and and then uh, next slide, please, Jackie. And ultimately. Uh, that's how uh, witness, uh, that's how, that's what uh, a valid will should look like. And again, the testator, that's the person who's doing the will, has to sign in the presence of two witnesses, or he can acknowledge this was my signature. And then in front of the two witnesses who really have to be uh, together at, at the time of the signing. So you can't have a separate witness in each room. Again, I'm not going to get bogged down with all of the formalities, but it's not once you have a set a uh, standard way of doing things that is sufficient. Now, I have to tell you, uh, and I will talk about contesting a will, but in that process, I have been called in to testify. It's something, it sounds more uh, official or, or threatening than it really is, but there are situations where people will contest a will. And so the draft person, which would be me, um, and the various, and the two witnesses have to show up in court and we get questioned by the party who's, who's so for, I'll give you an example. Mom dies and leaves her assets. She has three kids, but she leaves her assets to two kids for very, very valid reasons. She excludes the third child. The third child contests the will. And the third child has the right to uh, question as I said, the drafting attorney and the witnesses in court. And when I've appeared, some of the questions have been, well, do you remember, do you remember this client? And to be honest, um, I don't remember every client. I wish I did, but thankfully we have a, a thriving, um, robust uh, practice and we see a lot of people. And so I don't remember everyone, but what I'm able to say is that I do the set. I follow the same exact process every single time, meaning I might not remember Mrs. Smith, but I do remember that I ask every client, is this your will? Does it express your wishes? Um, is it okay with you if these two witnesses uh, witness your signing of the will? So I'm able to testify with complete assurance uh, that every one of my will signings is 
fairly standard because I stick to set rules. Uh, and the last thing I want to make note of is that there is, this is, I'm not pushing for myself. Thank God. Again, we're here to educate you. We have a thriving practice, but people who think they're going to save five, $600 by just printing um, a, 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 a standard will off the computer or uh, going with purchasing a legal document for $20, just understand that when you do it yourself, there is no presumption that it was done properly. But if the will is supervised, meaning the drafting and the execution, if the execution is if the execution is done under the supervision of an attorney, then there will be a presumption that it was done properly. I just saw, I do see some questions coming in. I might address them at the end. This one I happened to just get, when I just saw a glimpse of it. Um, beneficiaries of the will cannot be witnesses. Absolutely not. Uh, again, the whole point here is that we're trying to avoid any argument that there was undue influence. Well, if I'm a beneficiary of a will, um, I shouldn't be the witness because then there is an argument. Debbie Rosenfeld pressured Mrs. Smith into signing the will. And not only that, she was present at the, at the will signing to make sure that nothing went wrong. So that would be a big no-no. Okay, next slide, Jackie. Okay, so... Again, this is, I'm just going to cover this briefly because I do want to get into uh, the meat of this lecture, which is to discuss, which is to discuss um, the actual steps of probating and even maybe talk about litigation. Um, so what are the grounds to contest a will? Now, this is important. Uh, lack of proper execution. So essentially what I just said before, if you have a will where the testator signs in the middle of the will, and then there are several pack, uh, important, significant um, paragraphs and provisions after that signature, well, that's a problem. Uh, that will wasn't really uh, prepared properly. And if the testator doesn't sign in the presence of two witnesses who are there at the right time, that's lack of proper ex execution. And that would be a ground to say, this will should be thrown out. I would say um, the ones that I'm familiar with the most is that people come forward at the end and say, uh, you know, my mom, when she changed her will and she left everything to her caregiver, she did not have capacity at such time. And we can prove that based on doctor's notes, based on um, other things that will prove medical uh, medication she was taking and um, any specialist she went to who can attest to the fact that she did not have capacity at such time. Now, sometimes somebody might contest a will because they can say the will was revoked. You know, my mother specifically told me that she revoked the will that she had done in 2017. Well, again, that has to be proven. Uh, but these are reasons that people could come in and contest a will. Um, okay, fraud, that that person who, who claims to have signed the will, that's not her signature, uh, she wasn't even in New York at the time, those would be some examples of arguing that, um, and that I guess is in conjunction with forgery. You know, obviously if somebody else uh, signs the will that is an element of fraud. It's a, a specific uh, e evidence of fraud, but where either the person isn't who they said they were, um, the witnesses weren't necessarily there, but they got people to witness later on. Those are different um, causes of action. And finally, there is uh, undue influence. So the person um, has capacity, you know, and everything. None of this is black and white. I mean, proper execution, the, that's why the, rule, the rules for executing a will are so precise uh, so that they can be adhered to and a will can be challenged if they weren't. But the other ones, lack of testamentary capacity, undue influence, um, those are harder to prove. But um, what is capacity? Does the person have capacity? That is um, very, very, it's a very easy hurdle to overcome. Surprisingly, 
you, you could have a diagnosis of dementia, you could have a diagnosis of Alzheimer's and still have the capacity to sign a will. There's not um, a very high threshold to overcome. Undue influence, so a person could have capacity, but they could be um, under the throes, let's just say, or um, you know, under uh, the influence of a, of a relative or a child who has kind of stepped in and taken over their care, taken over who they get to meet, taken care, taken over who gets to visit the house. Um, and little by little, again, the person has capacity, but they're vulnerable, they're elderly or they're disabled. And that would be where somebody could get uh, the testator to change his or her wishes simply by exerting an undue amount of influence um, over the person, over the testator. Um, just want to note, it says right here, and I'm reading it, a mistake to, is not grounds for contesting a will. So even though we try to be very careful about um, typos and uh, misspelling names or uh, the, you know, in, a, in the case of a charitable bequest, baby's not necessarily getting the right name of the, the exact precise name of the corporate, the not-for-profit that we're donating to. These might be, be mistakes, but that doesn't um, give one a person grounds to contest a will. That's just grounds to say this was sloppy and should have been done a little more carefully but that's not necessarily grounds to contest a will. Now, the last thing that I wanna note, and this is extremely important in the probate process, and I see this happens a lot. So my neighbor dies, okay? Um, I have nothing to do with her in terms of being related to her, other than the fact that she was my neighbor, she was my dear friend, and, um, and she had said to me, you know, Debbie, I'm gonna leave you something in my will, no worries, okay? She passes away and lo and behold, I never get notice of the fact that there's a will being probated and I decide I'm gonna contest this will. If I am not a distributee, which is something that Ron mentioned, but again, what is a distributee? It's somebody who inherits when there is no will. So for example, if a widow passes away, widow meaning she has no spouse, and she leaves three children, those three children are the distributees. So in my case, if my neighbor was a widow with three kids, I'm just a neighbor. I'm a friend. I have no standing. I can't just waltz into court. Yeah, unless I can show that her earlier will had me as a beneficiary, and sure enough, it was revoked. Yes, that would give me standing. But just because I was told I'll give you something or I'm a friend or I'm a distant relative, I have no standing. So that, you know, I think people erroneously think that just about anybody can show up in court and contest a will. Absolutely not. Even if all any of the grounds that I just mentioned are present, a will can't be contested unless you yourself, the person contesting the will, has standing. Okay, Jackie, next slide, please. Okay, um, you know what? I am gonna just go uh, for purposes of time. Let's go to the next slide, please. Okay, so let's let's get into probate. Um, what is probate? And again, it all ties in. A will is a document where you dictate how your assets are distributed when you die. So let me give you a basic example. I have a house. I leave it to my son, okay? Does that give, a, this is again, a misconception on a lot of people's parts. Does that give my son the right after I die to just take my will and go and sell my house, right? And if somebody says, well, what is your authority to sell Debbie's house? And he says, look, I'm listed in the will. Okay, that would be complete chaos. And again, the reason I'm mentioning this is many people don't realize that in order for a will, a person's wishes in a will to be effectuated, that will has to go through the prop probate process. It's not enough that I had a will. My son then has to take my will. And as it says here, he has to go to surrogate's court. I'm not gonna generalize, but many, many people uh, do not 
do this probate process themselves. They do go to an attorney who specializes in this area. This would be a, pro, a person who specializes in estate administration. Um, but the will, it, again, when is the will utilized? I have this document. My assets when I die are in my name alone. Ron mentioned this, but I'm going to reiterate. So if I have a joint account in the bank naming myself and my son and I pass away, that account does not go through probate. Why? Because there's a named person on the account. If I have an IRA, um, if I have an IRA and my IRA names beneficiaries, right? My it's a it's an individual retirement retirement account. It doesn't matter if I had a fancy, amazing complicated, beautifully written will, 30 pages long, sealed with the strongest seal imaginable, that IRA avoids the probate process. It doesn't matter what my will says, meaning my beneficiaries named on those various accounts or named jointly on those accounts override my will. So a will is only relevant when a person dies with assets in their name alone. And the only way to access these assets is for the will to go through the probate process, okay? And many people say, what does probate mean? Um, the probate means it's the actual process of proving the will and making sure it's valid. So what is the process? The very first process when somebody dies, again, I'm just gonna, you know, obviously, where there's a, a and you'd be surprised this is just um somebody else just asked another question um there seem to be a lot of questions coming in i'm going to really really try to get them at the end otherwise maybe we can even have a follow-up lecture but i see that people a lot of people are sending questions somebody just quickly just asked what about power of attorney power of attorney is a document that is only relevant while a person is alive right i'm alive i get sick the agent on my power of attorney can do whatever my power of attorney authorizes him to do. When I die, that power of attorney is null and void. You cannot access any person's assets with power of attorney once they pass away. Hence the need for a will. That's where a will comes in. So um, I was about to say, I'm not going to go through every single step of a person dying, but you would be surprised how many clients um, call us like literally the very same day. I'll get calls, I'll come in and I'll check my machine, my messages, and I'll see a call from somebody at four o'clock in the morning, just want you to know mom passed away. I think that what people, yes, death obviously involves a lot of grieving. Um, it involves sorrow, loss, funerals, but there's a lot of downtime and people often, again, not because these people are vultures or, or there's a money grab going on, people often just reach out to anybody who helped with all of the paperwork while the person was alive. So as I intimated, we start the process by the person obviously has to die. And as Ron mentioned, if the person had a will, and as I stressed, and if the person had assets in their name alone, what we do is we fill out a petition that has to get filed with surrogates court. Who takes care of all of this? Again, every person appointed in a will can use an attorney to help with the entire process, but the person who handles this is the executor. That is the person who, that's the person who's appointed by the testator. That's the person who is appointed to carry out the wishes of the decedent. And again, when I give a very, very specified class to practitioners, there are things the executor has to do right away. Collect the mail, right? We don't necessarily know what the testator had in his or her name, right? So we sometimes I tell people, go into the apartment, go into the house, start collecting mail, because that gives you a good idea of, you know, because people get monthly statements. But anyway, the person fills out a petition, which is essentially, um, it's probably a four or five page document that gives the court a lot of information. It identifies the person who died. It identifies where they lived. Why is that important? Where a person lived, even if the person was in the hospital at the time, your, your will gets probated in the state where you were domiciled. So example, 
I live in New York. I'm not going to give myself as an example. I keep killing myself off, but let's just say such and such person lives in New York, but goes to Florida to visit. And while he's there, he has a massive heart attack and passes away. Every state has different probate procedure, procedures. That person, even though he was present in Florida at the time of his death, he is considered to be a New York domicile. That's what the place that you believed that you had this internal feeling that is your home. And the reason why that's important is because many people have more than one residence, right? Um, I feel very lucky to just have one residence. There are many people who have an apartment in Florida, a condo in Arizona. Their domicile is the place that they that they view as their home and the, and the place that they will return to ultimately. So in that case, the, the probate would not take place in Florida. It would take place in New York. Uh, Jackie, the next uh, slide, please. So as Ron mentioned, I'm just reiterating, the situation we're talking about now is probate. It presumes that the person had a will and also had assets in their name alone. What happens if a person doesn't have a will but has assets in his or her name alone, right? So the same man I just mentioned went to Florida, had a massive heart attack, unexpected. He didn't expect, he's a young man. He didn't expect to pass away. He never got around to doing these documents. Does that mean the money goes, his money goes to the state because he didn't have a will? That's another huge misconception. I have a lot of people who come into my office and say, I wanna do a will because I don't want my money to go to the government. One thing has nothing to do with the other. It is important to have a will because if you have a will, your wishes are met, right? You can articulate who you want your assets to go to. If you die without a will and if your assets, well, I'll mention the amount later. If you die without a will, you still have to go to court. It doesn't mean that your uh, assets ultimately go to the government. Your, your, your loved ones, your heirs have to go to court and they do what's called an administration proceeding. There's no will, but what is the court administering? In this case, your assets get distributed or such person's assets get distributed in accordance with state law. And I'm gonna elaborate on what that state law is. Um, that And every state has something called the laws of intestacy. And those laws specifically enumerate who inherits when there is no will, okay? If the estate is less than $50,000 in value, you don't have to go through full probate, even if the person has a will, and you don't have to go through full administration if the person has no will. If the estate is less than $30,000, $50,000, then what's called, it's called a small estate. It's called a voluntary uh, administration proceeding. Yes, you have to file paperwork with surrogates court, it's far simpler. It's a couple of pages. And in that case, I do have to tell you what I tell my clients. So let's just say a dad dies and he left $20,000. I don't want somebody incurring even $2,000 of legal fees for when there's a, a, a lesser amount involved. And so what I typically do is I send the clients the paperwork and, I, and it's easy to fill out. It is much easier. But I tell them, give me a call if you have any questions, but it's much more straightforward. The filing fee is $1 and it's, it's very doable. So one of the things that the executor has to file with the original, you have to, if you do have a will, and back to probate, if you have the original will, you have to file it in addition with a certified death certificate, okay? So now what is surrogate's court doing with this information? Um, and I wanna say, Again, the filing part is really not difficult, but what is it that surrogate's court is looking for? And by the way, I mentioned that the probate happens in the state where a person is domiciled. It gets even more specific. Yes, New York State has a set bunch of rules, a set bunch of rules, but every county has different nuances. So if I passed away and I live in Garden City, my will has to go, my, my executor has to go to Nassau County. If he goes to Queens County, his documents are all going to be returned. And there's no, there's no idea of reciprocity here. Yes, I, I will say this. It is a genteel process. Uh, people talk about probate if, as if it's a nightmare. 
it, it, as, as Ron said, it's not a four letter word, but you're not going to get, if you do happen to erroneously file papers in the wrong county, it's not like they're going to say to you, we are so sorry about your loss. And you know what, as a courtesy, we're just going to send it over to Nassau County. Queens County will not do that, nor will any county. They will just bounce the papers. So um, even though it's a genteel process and it's not as onerous as people intimate, um, you really do have to know what you're doing. You have to be familiar with the rules. So you're going to have to follow the papers where the person in the county where the person had his or her primary residence. Okay, uh, next slide, Jackie. Okay, so now what is it that the court is trying to glean from the information that was given? I'm gonna go back to my example before of a mother, a widow who leaves everything. She has three children and she leaves her estate to two kids. Okay, for various reasons. That's where the attorney drafts person's job comes in, right? When I met with that person, I got their information. And if she said to me, I have three kids, but one of them I haven't seen in 10 years, he or she hasn't called me. Um, I, I don't even know if, if he or she has any children. I don't know anything about their lives. I'm excluding him. As an attorney, I have to take copious notes. I'm going to get back to the attorney's job in a minute. But I want to, again, my point here is to illustrate what is the court looking for? What the court is looking for in this widow's case, she passes away. Even though she only named two children, they are the beneficiaries of her will. They are the two children who will step in and inherit everything. However, what does the court do? The court, from the form, the petition that is filled out, the court sees, wait a minute. Okay, wait a minute here. Mrs. Jones, she passed away. Her distributees, those are the people who are entitled to a share of Mrs. Jones' estate if she had died without a will, remember I talked about the laws of intestacy. If widow dies or widower dies, the children get everything. So that excluded child, I'm just going to name him John to make it easier. John is a distributee. He's not a beneficiary because he was excluded. He is a distributee. And what happens in the probate process? John gets his day in court, right? The court wants to make sure that anyone who would have received if there was no will, the court wants to make sure that they're okay with this. The court is looking, they're ultimately looking to protect Mrs. Jones because logically, if a person has three kids, people usually want their assets to pass through the bloodline. So if she excluded a kid, we want to know, we want to make sure that everything was done properly. So what is my point here? The, this case, Mrs. Joan had valid reasons for excluding John, but the court doesn't necessarily know that. So the court wants John to um, explain himself. They want him to know that he has certain rights. So in this case, and again, I'm going to illustrate John has to sign something called a waiver. That's the easiest way of doing this. So again, I fill the petition out and I send as the, if I'm retained as an attorney, I send a waiver to John who, and the waiver basically tells him, um, mom died on such and such date, you might not even know. And therefore please sign off here that you're okay with brothers number one and two, brother number one being the executor, brothers number one and two being, um, I'm sorry, being the beneficiaries, we want to make sure you're going to, you're okay with this. Now, sometimes John might say, you know what, I had nothing to do with mom. Uh, I, you know, I'll sign it. Most often, though, think about it. Money brings out the beast in people. Most often, um, or I, I'm not going to say most often, but very, very often, um, the, the, the excluded child will not sign. So what happens then? The court doesn't say, okay, the court still is looking to protect John because you know what? There might've been a situation where brother A and brother B colluded together. Mom had dementia. Brothers A and brothers B said, you know what? C has his own money. C, in this case, John, meaning in this case, my example, John was estranged. But what if brother C is just a little less involved? He's a good egg, but he's just not as involved. And A and B, 
basically collude to exclude him. That's why the court wants this excluded, disinherited child. And it doesn't have to be a child. If it's, uh, if it's an aunt and she has no children um, and she has no siblings, it would be her nieces and nephews. So it really depends on the situation. But here, my point is, John gets his day in court. If he refuses to sign the waiver, it's not so simple. The next thing that happens is John gets a citation. That means I, again, I as the attorney or the attorney has to issue um, a citation, which is something that the person has to be served with. So now it's a little more serious. And the person who did not sign a waiver gets a citation and is served. And this is the problem with the citation, okay? The citation, I'm saying it's a problem in the context of a probate proceeding. The citation, so again, following through with my example, John gets served with paper that says, okay, mom died on such and such date. If you have a problem with brother A being pointed as an executor to carry out the wishes of, of mom, you can show up and it literally tells the person, John, basically it tells him when he can show up where he can show up, literally to a T, the date, the time, the building, the floor number, uh, the room number of the court, that person has is given a roadmap of exactly what they can do to contest the will, okay? So I the whole purpose of my saying this to you, so the probate process, yes, if there's a situation where no one is disinherited, meaning all the distributees, any person who would be entitled by law to inherit, if all of them are beneficiaries, the probate process is very straightforward and is not as onerous as people make it out to be. So in this particular case, um, in this particular case, what, what happens is John has his day in court and John might decide by showing up, first of all, he also, through the probate petition, he gets to see the value of the estate. Wait a minute, mom had $4 million. Oh my, I'm not passing up on that. And you know what? I'm going to be upfront with you. Uh, we, I don't do the litigation here, but we as litigators in a contested estate. So let's just say John calls me up and says, listen, I haven't seen my mother in 10 years. I'll give you all the facts. Usually they don't necessarily tell all the facts. As we know, there are three sides to every story, but John might tell me I haven't been in touch or I haven't been as in touch as I would have been. And my mom pulled a fast one on me. Now, what am I going to say to John? I know the law. I'm going to say to him, John, you know, you are going to be questioned. The attorney who's representing the estate, representing the executor, is going to ask you, when did you last see your mother? Do you even know when she died? Uh, did your, do your children know who she is, right? They're going to ask these questions, and chances are you will not prevail. This is a good thing to hear. Most, most will contests, the people do not prevail. Very few wills are overturned. I forgot the percentage. I believe, and, and please, if there's any lawyer out there who knows better than I, I believe it's less than 2% of all wills get, get, get overturned, or less than 2% of all contested wills get overturned. But what is John, what is, what is his benefit? The benefit is that he can slow things down, right? He can, um, you know, he can say, even not signing a waiver and waiting for the citation slows things down. Then you have to wait for the court date. Then he could say, I can't make it on that date. Can we adjourn it? He can cause, he can kind of stick it to his brothers. He won't necessarily prevail, but he might reach a point where they come to him and they say, listen, we're going to give you $100,000 just so you go away. Um, and that happens. I'm not going to say that never happens. People make um, decisions. Sometimes uh, people feel time is money. Um, and also people are anxious to uh, close up an estate and they don't want the lingering effect of somebody who is actually considering uh, probating the will. So assuming that we didn't have a John here, assuming that it was very straightforward, right? So there wouldn't be a citation. Whoever had to sign waivers would sign waivers. Um, everything gets done properly. 
What happens is, is after the court is satisfied that it's the executor has met, has submitted everything, the court issues something called letters testamentary. That's essentially a certificate. It really is a piece of paper with a raised seal that gives the named executor the ability to carry out the testator who has now become the decedent, the testator has passed away, the decedent's wishes. So for example, um, fidelity account with $150,000 left in mom's name alone, name, and the will names four children as the beneficiary, uh, child day who's named as the beneficiary, uh, as the executor, I'm sorry, all he has to do once he has letters testamentary, he goes to fidelity, submits the letters testamentary, and Fidelity will open up an account in the name of the estate, okay? So that essentially um, the estate is created. Uh, let's just say the estate of Mrs. Jones is created and all of the funds start getting transferred to estate accounts. This is the job of the executor. First job is to file the petition. And then once you get letters testamentary, you can then start the process of distributing the assets. Now, I only have a few minutes left. I want to just go back. I want to circle back to Ron's talking about a trust. Um, so as I said, I'm sorry. Probate is a very genteel process. And when everybody is on the same page, okay? When I say the same page, I mean there's no fighting, um, that everybody is sharing equally, all the people who would have an inherited if there was no will, they're all the same people, so that there's really no problem. Probate is genteel, it goes smoothly, it's pretty seamless. I know COVID has thrown certain things out of whack in terms of timing, but I'm going to just conclude by saying, when you have the following situations, don't, I would not rely on a real, will, I would rely on doing my estate planning through a trust, and essentially everything gets transferred during your lifetime into a trust so that probate is avoided. As I just indicated, um, one example is when you're writing out a beneficiary, right? Because that will, you, don't, you want to avoid a will contest. A will contest can be avoided if you have nothing in your name alone. If you have real property in more than one state, Right. When somebody dies. OK, it seems so seamless, but they have a house in Queens and they have a condo in Arizona and another uh, another vacation home in California. When you have real property, every state where you own real property, you have to go through something called ancillary probate might be seamless and straightforward, but it's very costly and time consuming. That would be an example where a trust comes in. One other thing I want to mention, what about, I have so many clients who come in and they don't have children and their relatives are very, very distant or they have, they have no relatives that they can name. Again, the court doesn't accept my word for it. Um, oh, your honor, uh, decedent had no children, no spouse, no anything. No, they make me do tremendous due diligence to locate those remote relatives who are still the closest in line. So in situations like that, I'm going to say that in, in situations like that, you're doing the people who you are leaving your assets to, you're doing them a big service if you try to avoid probate and do a trust. If there is a spouse plus children, do you get do grandchildren get anything under intestacy? Uh, the answer is no. Um, the answer is no, meaning if a person leaves a spouse and children, okay, um, that person's, the person's spouse, as Ron indicated, according to New York state law, the spouse, uh, inherits the first 50,000 and then half of the balance of the estate and the other children inherit the other half. The only way that there would be any inheritance for grandchildren is if a child, um, if a child predeceases, right? So if a person dies and leaves three, uh, two kids, but one predeceased child, then that predeceased child's children step in as, um, as, as a, as a distributee. Um, can in-laws or cousins be witnesses? I would say that cousins can be witnesses. I would stay away from in-laws. Again, 
technically they're not inheriting, um, meaning if obviously if they're not named beneficiaries, then, but you know, their, their, uh, their children um, stand to benefit. So they might, you know, again, this would not be um, a problem if in fact, this would not be a problem if in fact there's no will contest, but if there is a will contest, then that might be problematic. So I would try to avoid that. Next question, can um, an anonymous, I'm sorry, um, can an, a non-resident alien be an executor? Um, the answer is that a non-resident alien can only serve as executor if there is a co-executor who is a, a resident and a citizen. So um, that's the way we get around that. But, you know, it's um, it's not ideal, but that's the only way you can have it with a, a co-executor that does satisfy those requirements. Okay. Um, now, the next question is an interesting question. Can a will leave property in another country? And the answer is, yes, I can say in my will that I leave my... Um, my apartment in England um, uh, to my friend. The problem is that every state, every country, I'm sorry, has its own laws. And so what is what we typically advise that client to do is just have a separate will with respect to the separate property that you own in another country. But let's say you don't do that. If you don't do that, you're just going to still have to go through a lot. Your heirs are going to have to go through a lot of hurdles because they first have to probate the will in New York or wherever. And then they would actually have to go far. Either way, they're going to need a lawyer in England. But this way, your will might not comport with English law and therefore it might have no bearing. So it really makes the most sense to have a separate will in the jurisdiction where the property is located. Again, I'm not talking about any place in the United States, but out of the country, it absolutely makes sense to have a separate document following the laws of that country. Um, can an executor be a beneficiary? Absolutely, absolutely yes, right? An executor can be a beneficiary, but a benefit, um, sorry, but the executor cannot be, right? So I can appoint my daughter to be the executor of my will, and she's also going to get a quarter of my estate. That's 100% fine. She cannot be a witness. That's the issue. Um, so, and the executor just has to be um, anybody who's over the age of 18, and an executor and a beneficiary, I'm just repeating myself, can in fact be the same person. Okay, um, second to last question. What if decedent dies without a will and only leaves a co-op to his two kids? Uh, what is the procedure for the kids to get access to his co-op? Co um, so the answer is, again, something that we've talked about. And the answer is that in that case, it, that person, the heirs, the children, um, are going to have to go to court instead of going through probate, which is the process where you prove a will, they're going to have to go to, through estate administration. One of them can be appointed as the administrator. The other one has to sign off and say it's okay. They follow a very similar process. But again, state law says that both kids inherit um, equally, uh, but they still have to go, even though we know how it's going to be distributed according to law, we still have they still have to go through court in order to access that apart that co-op. And ultimately, ultimately, the um ultimately the uh certificate that the administrator gets is called letters of administration rather than letters testamentary. That's the only difference. So they would need that certificate in order to uh, carry out and actually uh, distribute the, the co-op. Okay, um, if my husband has only a car and financial assets with beneficiaries designated, is probate still necessary? And the answer is no. With a car, and again, a car gets a little tricky and, and the things that sometimes seem the easiest are the hardest. Um, with a car, 
you um, can go through the Department of Motor Vehicles. I believe the first car, a car passes to a spouse, that's not a problem. Um, if the car is valued at more than $50,000, you might actually have to do a probate proceeding for that car. But so again, I said initially probate can be avoided, but it really depends on the value of the car. But I'm fairly sure the first car provided it's under $50,000 um, can just pass to a spouse without a problem. Okay. Um, let's see. Are there any more questions? Oh, Debbie, there, are, there are a lot of questions in the chat. Ah, okay. I don't know if I'll get to all of them. Um, okay. Okay. Uh, somebody asked if all other assets are in a trust, this is what I sometimes do. And I apologize in advance. I start talking, I start speaking quickly because I want to get to everybody's questions. Um, wait, I just lost my questions. Okay, sorry. If, ooh, um, if all assets are in a trust, but one co-op apartment is not allowed to be put into a trust, what would be the best way to avoid uh, probate? Um, that's a great question. And it's really hard. It's really, really hard to answer. Uh, Co-ops often um, allow transfers to a trust, but some co-ops say it's not okay. Um, and the answer is sometimes attorneys will just handle, because how is a co-op represented? The ownership of a co-op is represented by a stock certificate and a proprietary lease. Some attorneys will go through the process of um, just assigning the proprietary lease and the, uh, uh, the stock certificate to another person, even though, so it's, physically done, even though the co-op hasn't approved it. But honestly, I don't know of any cases where there that's managed to, to work. Next question, can you contest a trust? Well, that's a great question. The answer is absolutely. Um, however, unlike a will, a will, as I mentioned, gives somebody, um, gives the person, the potential contesting party, it gives them a roadmap of exactly what they have to do. So in my example, where a child has been estranged for 10 years and has not spoken to anybody, the fact that he would even be aware of the existence of a trust um, is, is unlikely. So with contesting a trust, first of all, um, there's a, a higher level um, that has to be accomplished in order to contest. But furthermore, nothing is stopping the parties, the, the, net, the other parties from distributing the assets in the interim. With a will, everything gets put, everything is frozen when a will is contested. That's not the case with the trust. So yes, there are trust contests, but there are fewer um, and there are higher hurdles to um, overcome. Um, can the witnesses be a beneficiary of the will? The answer is no. Um, can the person appointed as executor of the will also be a witness to the signing of the will? The answer is no. Why? As long as somebody has any type of interest in um, the, the, the assets, whether it's in the person's will, whether it's in a fiduciary capacity, meaning executor or trustee, but furthermore, as a beneficiary, um, not good practice um, to be a beneficiary. Okay, Ron mentioned special needs trust for the benefit of a child with a disability. Can it be used for other people as well as an elderly spouse? Now that is an excellent question. And the answer is no, okay? Why, why am I saying this? If I have a disabled child um, or a disabled spouse and I wanna do a, 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 a supplemental needs trust for them, Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. The answer is yes. If I have, so just let me repeat myself. If I have a disabled child, meaning somebody under a minor, under 18, or I have a disabled spouse, I cannot do a living trust. The trust does not allow me. I don't know the specific reasons for that, but it will invalidate uh, my Met Medicaid eligibility and potentially the spouse or the child's Medicaid eligibility. The only way to do this is by putting your special needs trust into the will. Okay, what happens? The trust is created, meaning it's articulated when I sign that will, but it doesn't go into effect until I die, right? So in my case, if there's a disabled child and I have a su supplemental needs trust articulated for that child's share in my will, it doesn't get 
triggered until I actually die. And then through the probate process, this trust is actually um, created and goes into effect. Okay, Shane, I guess you'll just tell me when I can't go anymore. But um, what if somebody was named power of attorney unbeknownst to you, but you are the executor? How can you protect funds from being withdrawn from accounts? So this is like kind of a complicated question. Um, power of attorney, again, um, terminates when a person dies and the agent on the power of attorney might not be, as you're indicating here, might not be the same as the executor. Now, if you question that a person is abusing a power of attorney during that person's lifetime. So, okay, again, Mrs. Smith, she's alive and she appointed an agent and the agent is withdrawing funds and you feel that they're abusing their power, then you'd have to go to court. You might have to do a guardianship. You're, you're, in a way, it has nothing to do with your being an executor. It's just, um, uh, you know, you, you, it has nothing to do with being an executor. It's more because you're concerned about the well-being of this person in question. And if they have an agent on a power of attorney, if the agent is just paying their bills and withdrawing money for their living expenses, that's not abuse. But if you feel that it is being abused, then yes, that would be grounds for going for some type of litigation, uh, typically a guardianship telling the person that, telling the court that you believe this person is in danger for the various reasons that you're going to enumerate. Okay, for full, small estates, if the person has a joint account of $100,000 with children and there's no other assets, is it still considered a small estate? So now, you're, I think this question, the person who asked this question is, mixing up phrases. An estate is anything that I own at my death, right? So if I die and I have a house and I have joint accounts and I have um, an investment account, regardless of how they're held, that's my estate, okay? But so here, the person has an estate, they have a joint account, but that estate, it's not a small estate. It's not anything. It's an estate. Um, the size of my estate, of that person's estate is 100,000. Does that estate have to go through probate? No, because there's a joint account owner. And so it's going to pass by operation of law. So again, why don't I change that question? If the person has a joint account of a million dollars with children, the account is owned jointly with children. Is it considered an estate? Yes, it's an estate but it doesn't have to go through probate. It doesn't have to go through court because everything can be accessed. If however, that person has $100,000 and it's in their name alone, then it is not a small estate because it's $50,000 or more. And the only way to access it is again, by going to court. So yes, small estate only has a relevance if in fact the person has assets in his or her name and there's no name beneficiary, then in that case, they have to go to court. Again, it's a small estate proceeding, meaning because it's less than 50,000. I hope that answer was clear. Um, okay, an attorney handled a real estate per sale for a person who died on a Sunday, just after the Friday closing. What does the attorney owe to the estate other than the cash from the sale? Okay, I'm not, okay. The person dies on a Sunday after a Friday closing. So yeah, the, the, what, what becomes part of the uh, probatable estate uh, would be the proceeds from the sale of the, the, from the real estate, the sale of the real estate of that person who sold it on, on Friday and then died on Sunday. If that person deposited it into an account and the account is in the person's name alone, that's part of the um that's part of the probatable estate or probate uh, you know the administration and that a distributee would have a right to is the attorney obligated to give the estate all the documents relating to the sale so now this goes into litigation um at least initially the attorney is not obligated to do that but if the if the um ultimately there is a contest a will contest and 
um, the attorney who's representing the distributee wants to do some due, due diligence because there's a concern that money might have been transferred, right? So I'll give you an example. Let's say that real estate sale on Friday was for $500,000. Uh, Friday, uh, Sunday, the person dies and there's lo and behold, only $200,000 in the account when it's submitted for probate. What, what happened to the other 300,000? Um, so yeah, I, I would say that, you know, again, the party requesting those documents would have to go through discovery and demand to see them. The attorney doesn't have to just give them over um, without a, a, an official request. Uh, can the distributee named in the will as the executor also challenge the sale if a successful challenge would, in, would okay, this is a little, the distributee, meaning a person who would inherit if there was no will, um, but is also named in the will, can they challenge the sale? Um, I'm not sure. Uh, I, I think we'd have to speak privately about this. I'm not, I don't fully understand this last question, honestly. So, I mean, I appreciate all these questions that keep me on my toes, but this last one, I just, <laughs> yeah. I need a little more information. Okay. So what, I, what we can do, um, the rest of the question, you can you can email it to me and I can forward them to Jackie and then if they can answer it to you, for you guys and then they will, um, because we have to go. I know it's always, it's always like that. We never be able to finish the question. But, but that's I promise we'll line. have that another means people session. People are interested. I'm so excited. They are. And that's I'm okay. happy to come back anytime to answer more questions. Yes, definitely. So we do have another um, presentation with um, the, the law firm. It's going to be in Mar March 3rd at 1 p.m. It's going to talk about estate planning 101. So, and then some of you has mentioned if we're going to have the presentation PowerPoint. Yes, I will send it to you right after. Again, thank you, Debbie. Thank you. You're Jackie. so welcome. You were a great audience. Thank you, Jackie, for <laughs> thank, thank you, you for organizing this. Okay. Goodbye, thank everyone. You, everyone. Bye, Take everyone. Care. And have a great afternoon, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye now. Shana. Thank you, Jackie. Bye. Thank you for everything. Bye-bye.